Happy Wednesday, guys. Welcome to Brush Your Bat for Wednesday, July 7th. Running through the picks for the day, and then uh, today's UFC day. So we'll run through UFC 264, what we're looking at. If you're new to the channel, welcome. Uh, we UFC is like our, that's like the, the baby, the passion thing. Um, yeah, I don't know. I really, really like it. So we'll run through stuff there. I actually really, really like a play for this week. Uh, more than I have in some time, so we'll touch on that. But uh, the MLB slate for today, we got a little more on the bone than yesterday. Uh, the Phillies, minus 133. Wheeler over Mills. I feel like there's a pretty wide spread in pitching here. Wider than the minus 130 on its own. Uh, Wheeler has been the one constant for the Phillies this year. He's been really good. He's been their rock. Um... So if they are indeed turning things around here, they're doing so behind their ace. It's like a weird thing, the Phillies, right? Because Joe, bumbling, fumbling Joe, uh, you know, is one thing. But they have the club, the guys in the clubhouse. Didi is one of the best clubhouse guys in baseball. Uh, Harper, I mean, I think now as, we, you know, as, as much of a poor teammate as he was on the Nationals. I think he might be as good of a teammate on the Phillies. You see like a decisive flip in all of his actions, things like that. Oh, you coming to say hi, dude? Hello. You want to show everyone how big you're getting? You're getting pretty big, huh? Yeah. You want to say hi? Um... Yeah, so, so it would not surprise me if they do turn things around. I would almost like bank on them too, uh, as weird as it is with Joe. But Nola pitched well the other day. I think momentum behind the pitching staff. Uh, and then on the other side of the coin, the Cubs are straight free falling. I feel like the magic has left the building. Uh, and now the only part left is breaking up the band, which is going to be sad to see. But. Uh, you know, that Bryant, Rizzo, Baez little core is not going to be together very much longer. The Astros uh, A's under 8.5 at minus 105. Manea versus Garcia. I think Manea matches up well here with the Houston offense. Uh, he's smart enough uh, and has a varied up enough approach uh, pitch repertoire where in matchups with them, he could induce enough fly balls. He can keep that ratio. I think he can get more fly balls than ground balls. He's probably not going to strike out a ton of people against them, but I think he can get some easy outs. Uh, not super helpful at Minute Maid, so I think the matchup is good. I actually watched his last startup start against the Astros earlier this season, and he was he had nothing uh, pitching wise, and I think he's still limited. Like they got a ton of hits, like something like ten hits. It was double digit hits. But he held them to, uh, what are you doing? But he held them to, I want to say, like three runs. So, yeah, he was able to limit the damage. I think it's a good spot for him. On the other side, Luis Garcia is someone that we have pegged for regression in the longer term. Um, I think we played the over against Baltimore his last time out uh, successfully, I want to say. But... Oakland's lineup is just, I don't know, it's not uh, performing well at all. So I think we can play the under, um, and both bullpens are in good shape. So I, I don't know, I can, I can see like a 3-4-1 game either way in that one, something like that. The Blue Jays, Orioles over 10.5, Ryu versus Harpy. This is the third start for both guys against the opposing team in like a few uh, week period here. Harvey on the one side, I mean, against this Young Jays lineup, has to be out of tricks at this point. Um, it's actually crazy. It's like, if you, I don't know, if you've been a baseball fan for uh, for some period of time, you were around for like the 90s, uh, where when you were looking at box scores and stuff, like late 90s and stuff, with like Manny Ramirez, where he's rocking like, you know, like 330, uh, 50, so 40, like, you know, high 40s homers, like 150 RBIs, those stat lines. Like, even Miggy had those at points. I mean, it's great. And, and you looked at, like, how many guys had over 300, how many guys had over 400 OBP. You know, it's like you had to scroll down the page to, like, see how many guys it was when you were, like, geeking out on stats. 
Now, when I checked, I, mean, I haven't checked in, you know, I think like three weeks or something. The last time I checked, there were like seven or like nine guys hitting over 300. Um, and you know how many of those guys are on the Jays and like how many guys on the Jays are like up near 300? Uh, a lot more than the rest of the league. Um, yeah, so I, I just don't see how Harvey keeps it together for a third straight time. He's been successful two times in a row. We got to be out of tricks. Baltimore's lineup is cooking. Hey, Dio, what are you doing, buddy? You got to go out? Um, Baltimore line, Baltimore's lineup is cooking. And uh, third time against Ryu, who hasn't been as effective this year. I mean, he's just not that pitcher he was in that super isolated sample size. He's a really good pitcher, but he's not like, you know, a legitimate uh, ace in the major leagues. So we'll take the over in that spot, the high number of 10 and a half. The Rangers minus 151. Mize versus Gibson. We'll take Kyle Gibson in this spot. I think he's a little too much for the young Tigers lineup. Tigers are also getting dangerously close to 500. I think they're like seven or eight games under right now. Sell a little bit of stock. Um, we have an innings limit on Casey Mize, which is not going to be ideal in this spot. You know, going out to duel with Kyle, they're not going to get a lot off Kyle Gibson in like a matinee game in Texas. I don't know. I just can't see it. Um, and both bullpens are rested. So the Texas bullpen will be fine. And then if somebody, you know, the short inning, the short uh, start for my is kind of worries me on the under. Otherwise, I think I would be on the under in this spot. Um, sprinkling the Pirates at plus 147. Crow over Smiley. This is full on disaster mode at this point for the Braves. Whoever, all the people that were chiming in the comments and stuff, like, yo, the Braves are, are cooked, all these things. Yeah, they're not. I don't think, uh, I think the Phillies have a better chance of turning it around this year than the Braves. We're going to have to drop them. They're not going to be nine in the power rankings anymore. This, like, unwielding respect I've been giving them has to get turned off. I mean, you just can't be... What, they lost, like, an extra inning game, a one-run game to the Pirates today after what happened last night. I mean, we can't... We just can't. We can't continue. I mean, that's, like, that's the kind of game... Beat, losing the Pirates in a close game, that's in a response game. I mean, you have to win that. Um, I don't think the Pirates match up uh, poorly with Smiley and... Uh, the young Will Crow kid, super interesting because he was on that spin rate decline list we've been calling out um, post the, you know, checks or whatever checks for everything. Um, he's been on that spin rate decline list, but actually by the eye test watching him pitch, I've watched him like once or twice since that. I actually like what I see. I think the kid knows how to pitch anyways. Um, so plus 147. I'm either going to sprinkle, I could see myself filling that up, um, but sprinkle, Pirates plus 147. The Cardinals, Giants over eight and a half, and sprinkling St. Louis at plus 163. Oviedo over Wood. Kind of a little upset with myself for not taking San Fran today behind Wainwright, who's been like that guy on the... Um, for this rotation, really for this team. Like, think about how, where this team would be without his steady hand to top the rotation. Like, with everything else that's happened in this rotation, they'd be in a really, really rough spot. Um, and then they come out yesterday, get the win behind him, building the momentum. We said, like, if they got over the hump in that game, uh, whatever preview for, like, Monday's game or whatever it was with Gaussman, Kim, we said if they got over that hump and they won that game, we were going to start taking them, and I just kind of spazzed on it yesterday. But I will take them here at a pretty big number um, in a spot where we know uh, the – I mean, and, for, and the other thing about it is, like, Yachty Molina, this is a Yachty Molina-led team. There's a level of respect there that I just kind of, you know, but um, – I think the spread on Oviedo Wood is wide in a spot where the Cardinals are going to score X amount of runs. They hit lefties well, even the best lefties they face. It's what this lineup was built to do. Um, 
it gets, you know, it's super, there's a super, super thin lineup against righties, but it fattens out a little bit against lefties. In this matchup, it's Wood, and then all the best arms in the uh, San Fran bullpen are lefties. So the Cardinals are always going to match up well with the Giants this year, something to tab for us. Um, and I actually like this Oviedo kid more than general market sentiment. I think he's trending up. Um, and improving start to start like you can see it. I like his demeanor. Um, he's a buy stock for me Cards the one little worry spot about that why I'm keeping it a sprinkle because I actually do think it's good value on the starter The cards bullpen's been a bit overworked um, So I think you could see some late San Fran runs. I think the Cardinals definitely get theirs So we're playing the over the Nationals, Padres over eight and a half. The Padres minus 170. Corbin versus Paddock. I don't know. Let's say it together. Patrick Corbin versus the Padres. Patrick Corbin versus the Padres. It's got like a five inning, five run first inning ring to it. Uh, kind of like uh, the Yankees versus Sheffield. The Yankees versus Sheffield. It sounds like a lot of runs. Um, I just, I can't envision a world where he has a good start. Organization is familiar with him from his time in Arizona. It's not like it's just a complete, yeah, I don't know. And and he's just, I mean, even by the eye test, he's still got, like, he's always had, um, he's always been this guy that's not like, not all or nothing, but, you know, he's got really good stuff. So, like, he's wild. He's very, uh, throughout the season, like, it's hot stretches, it's cold stretches with him. But now the stuff just, like, is fading. Right? So it's like without as many weapons and you're that hot and cold guy, it's just the recipe's just, I, I think we're gonna see like his stock fade fast. Like he's not gonna have like a graceful exit to the league. I think you're gonna see him fade kind of fast. The Nationals lineup is hitting well though. So I think off Paddock or the Padre Pen, they get enough for the over. Like that spot, but just the spread between the starting pitchers. Paddock is going to be a good pitcher at some point. He will. Um, and no matter how well the Nats lineup is hitting, I mean, they're going to have to score like, I feel like, seven, eight runs or something. Uh, I just feel like the, the Padres should just absolutely mash um, Corbin. Sprinkling the Indians in game one, if the uh, matchup holds Mejia versus Waka, it's really just as long as um, it's somebody semi-competent versus uh, Waka in this spot. I think as long as we get, you know, those two, three innings off Waka or whatever, we will hit him um, and alone at this price. That's why as long as on the other side, if someone's semi-competent, if we're getting... Um, at this price, I'm saying the price isn't out yet, but I'm assuming uh, we're gonna get like plus 165 or better. I mean, if, if we don't, then, then whatever. But as long as we're at like plus 165 or better, I think it's worth sprinkling it in the double header, not as much uh, responsibility for the bullpen. Cleveland bullpen's been giving them a lot of trouble lately. They're on our regression list, uh, so it's not a surprise to us, but this limits the exposure to that. So as long as it's a good price, uh, plus 165 or better, sprinkling some Indians. And then I think I'm, I lean Mariners, but after that performance just last night, um, you know, I don't know, I don't necessarily want to, but Kikuchi's been pitching well. I'm not a big Domingo Herman guy. So like I said it last night, I mean, we best bet the Yankees yesterday, but I said last night, if we come out and lose like the next two games of the series, that's a very us thing to do. Um, generally, especially in the AL, like when you get a big offensive explosion and you win, you score like 10 or more runs, which is like a very big number um, in baseball. The, thanks Jake. Um, I like taking that team the next day or at least put a circle around them as like, you know, that's a significant number to hit you're doing something right to do so. I think that's our baseball slate for today though. I am not missing anything. Nope. On to UFC, UFC 264, Poirier McGregor three. Very excited for that one. Um, I was on Poirier last time, but I don't know about this time. As like a slate favorite, I missed the pick em. And uh, like obviously way more tools and all of that. 
But I also think I don't like the, I saw him with like the, uh, you know, I put you on AirPod mode or airplane mode thing, airplane mode. Uh, comment from Poirier and Poirier's always been like this humble whatever guy like even last time I think he was confident going in but he was like this humble like like be who you are that guy from Louisiana when you try to be someone who you're not is generally when, when bad things happen so I'm not thrilled about that I'm not going to lay uh, that price as a favorite especially when it's like the worst thing that can happen for the UFC but on fights I do like I love Max Griffin this week. I started buying, I got uh, some minus 170, minus 175. I grabbed more minus 185 once I got a little wider limit. Um, I like Max Griffin a lot in this one. Carlos kind of old, dude. I mean, the, so he had, had the five fight losing streak, then the two fight win streak versus Court McGee and Matt Brown. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think I also like everyone's uh, talking about how stock is so high on Matt Brown after a lot after the, uh, where it's like or not stock so high, but like oh, see Matt Brown's not co not cooked. He beat Diego Lima kind of thing. I think the biggest thing that stood out after that fight was those two used to train together and like Diego Lima looked up to Matt Brown because uh, or not train together like something about the Ultimate Fighter or something where like Matt Brown mentored him or something like that. But they're really good friends. This whole thing. That whole thing stood out wildly. It's like, yeah, the more experienced guy, when they like, when he saw him coming up, like he's got a much better perspective of weaknesses, all these things, and then the alpha thing and the friendship, and like, yeah, had I known that, I would have been on Matt Brown too. I think that's like overrating that that win, um, and I think I don't know. Max Griffin's steadily looking better and better, and you watch the tape, and I think Condit took a bunch of right, has taken a lot of right hands recently from guys that just didn't have the power or weren't in the position. Like you could see Matt Brown knew what he wanted to do versus Condit, but he couldn't like physically do it. I feel like that was a lot about that Diego Lima fight too. He's like, I want to do these things. I can't like physically get there. It just took him a little longer, but he eventually found the shot. I feel like he was trying to do that but against Condit and knew what he had to do, but like couldn't physically achieve it. Max Griffin's aging much, much better, is much more physically, you know, whatever. Don't need to explain that part. I think he's going to land a big right hand. He's packing a lot of power now. You listen to interviews, he's extremely confident. Um, I mean, he's been working really hard on his game. It's like everything you would want to hear from a guy who's going to go out and win, continue the momentum in his career. This is a huge opportunity for the guy. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm... I'm putting pretty significant stock in Max Griffin. I think he definitely wins this week. Um, I really do. I'm investing as such anyways. I haven't taken anything else yet. Um, I probably should have taken Wonder Boy already. From a stylistic perspective, it seems like if Gilbert's going to have to come in um, and stuff like that uh, and like close whatever distance, that's going to be perfect for a striker like Wonder Boy. That's so adept. That's like such a next level striker. Also, Gilbert took some hard shots. I wouldn't be surprised if he gets finished in this one. Um, kind of like the after effects of all those Usman shots he took. And so a bunch of interviews. He just seems like the confidence has kind of left him. Like that was my one shot. That was like my whole career working up to that. And then Yada. He seems a little overrated to me. Like this is a guy that I only started watching UFC like semi recently, but when I started watching it, it was like prior to I want to say the Damian Maya knockout, and like the narrative on him was like, you know, uh, this guy's like pretty good. He's capitalized on some short notice wins in a row, but like you know, he wasn't that good at one point, and now it's like look, holy, holy cow. So. Uh, I feel like stylistically all that stuff, Wonder Boy should have it mindset-wise. He's got to be hungry, too. It's almost like this destiny thing for him to go meet Usman, which is a good matchup for him, too. Um, and eventually maybe get the belt. But I like, seems like he's the play in this spot. Greg Hardy, I kind of think uh, as a dog, like I saw like uh, plus 115 or something, plus 120 when I added more Griffin earlier. And uh, I don't know, Ty Tui Vasa doesn't seem that good to me. And it doesn't seem like he has a great gas tank, which is like Hardy's problem, it seems. Because while he's striking, I mean, 
I feel like everyone's like, it's like everyone's like, this guy's good, and then after a couple of performances, like a loss to Ty Burris, like whatever, it's like now this guy sucks. It's like now this guy sucks. Uh, and like, you know, referencing back to the DeCastro fight too, like he was losing to DeCastro, and then, uh, you know, the leg thing called out by DC, and that's why he won that fight and stuff like that. It's like, you know, I think the, the, the Castro guy before his mind got messed up like somewhere with the breaking the leg or whatever happened during that thing and I don't know if he got it fully fixed. But that guy was dangerous at one point. I think it was just like, you know, he's almost like a bomb that got the fuse sniffed. It's like not worth anything more after. It's like, but at one point, I think that was a good win at that point. Um, but yeah, I think the stock is so low on Hardy. I watched the tape, I mean, Hardy hung with Volkov. I mean, it was like, the guy's way more experienced, he's so much bigger, it's like, with the combination stuff, what are you gonna do? But that was like a very respectable performance for Volkov to me. I don't think that was very good uh, on the flip side. Uh, so I think, I don't know, with how low public sentiment is on Hardy, especially if the line gets better, I'm looking at Hardy. I'm looking at this Hugh Yao Zhang guy. Uh, the Asian guy coming off like a two and a half year layoff versus this Amadowski guy that's also coming off a very long layoff. The Yao Zhang guy has fought his first two fights, uh, one at heavyweight, one at light heavyweight. Now he's down at middleweight after a long layoff. I'm expecting maybe the guy now, but I probably want to see the guy on the scales first. But from, I haven't gotten to uh, break this one down tape wise yet. But from what I've heard, he's gonna have like the volume edge. He has a pretty good chin and stuff against this Hamadovsky guy that went for uh, that thing. It's gonna be like very KO or nothing -y here. What's up, man? Oh, I left the door open. Okay. Um, and then, uh, and then I'm looking at Nico Price. Um, sorry about that. She got a lot more protective with little pooch in the house. And I'm looking at Nico Price because uh, I watched for whatever preparation for a Dusko Todorovic fight, that first fight versus, uh, with Perea versus Todorovic. And Todorovic basically just out-toughed him. And once Perea figured out, like, I'm not gonna knock this guy out, he just kind of folded like a sack of bricks. And one was like, I guess I'm gonna lose now. I don't think Nico Price is very good, but he definitely has a chin and he definitely isn't a pussy. So, uh, I don't know. If he ain't gonna quit, it's like, who's gonna quit for Maybe Prayer just like wrestles him though. Maybe that's the move. And then just like controls him like that. And I feel stupid about the bet. But I'm looking at Nico Price. Cause like in my head too, it's like, why isn't this line wider or something? Uh, maybe I just don't know enough about Price yet. And then in terms of game two of the NBA finals, Kind of like in the preview we put up, if you haven't watched on YouTube, you're interested. But our preview is basically like, uh, if it doesn't become the holiday, like everything goes to holiday, they hand over the team, because PJ Tucker flipped out on everyone, basically. We couldn't figure out a way where they were gonna actually do it. Um, and if the offense just looks the same and everything, uh, yeah, it's not gonna be a close series. And uh, if they have the pieces, obviously. But I mean, I saw possessions tonight, uh, you know, in game one, where it's like, I saw Chris Milton bring the ball all the way up the court. This is with Drew Holiday in the game, bring the ball all the way up the court and just like one dribble, one like little shimmy move and suicide at the rim. And it's like, for a layup, it's like contested layup. What the fuck are we doing? What, how can that be some semblance of like, even resembling what the most efficient offense could be for this team? It makes no sense to me. I think, I don't know, after watching that, I mean, you just can't continue to expect uh, Chris Milton, when he's out of his mind, to find his sanity, because it's like, do you want to win? It makes no sense to me. I feel like they are going to, that, the dick swinging contest between him and Giannis, or whatever that whole thing is, it's like, my team, no, it's my team, well, I like cheese, oh, I like cheese, whatever it is, is gonna lose them a championship. I don't know how they're gonna win. Obviously, they have the matchup, um, you know, the effect of, like, Giannis being back in the other game. Like, the traditional play here is to take the Bucks to spread. Whoever wants to, feel good doing it. I'll be on Phoenix or nothing. I'm probably going to this is just going to be a be on nothing kind of game. And then, you know, you see that happen. You see it continue even more, and you just take the Suns game three. Um, and it's going to be a very short series. I still kind of think it's going to be a short series. Happy, uh... 
yeah, I think that is all. Happy Wednesday. We'll talk to you guys tomorrow.